Okay, just a second. All right. So thank you, everyone. I'm Adam. Um, and uh, thank you for having me here. Today, I'm going to talk about this thing that sounds, the title is a bit long and technical, a structural summary Schroeder theorem for Cartesian products. But the talk itself is, I hope, gonna be quite the opposite. I am aiming for a lighter, more survey-like talk. I wanna to tell you about this field a bit, uh, but it's up to you. So, I mean, Whenever you want to hear more details, if you want to dig deep into the technicalities, just let me know. We can talk about it as much as you want. And in general, uh, I like it when people participate. So feel free to unmute yourself whenever you want. Um, don't be shy. You're welcome to ask questions, make comments, whatever. Uh, if you have a joke you really want to tell us, that's also good. Um, so the result I'm going to talk about is a joint work with Olivine Silier, who is only an undergraduate student. She's a very exceptional undergraduate student. She started her PhD this fall, and I'm sure we're gonna hear about her more. And also, as I wrote in the abstract, uh, this, is a bit, this can be seen as shameful advertising. By chance, this month I have a new book. So this talk is about incidences. And by chance this month, my new book is published, <clears throat> Polynomial Methods and Incidence Theory. It's one of those uh, series of gray books with uh, colorful stripes, if you know them, uh, uh, Cambridge Studies in Advanced Mathematics. And uh, yeah, that's, that's the introduction. So let's start, what are incidences? So let's start with what is maybe the simplest incidence problem. When the plane, we have some points and we have some lines and an incidence is a pair, one point, one line. So here the point is P, the line is L, such that the point is on the line. Let's do a couple of easy examples just to make sure everyone are with me. Here on the left, we have one incidence, one pair point on a line. Here in the middle, we have two incidences. So this point forms an incidence with a line and this point forms an incidence with the same line. It doesn't matter if it's the same line, and to make sure that you're following the definitions correctly, maybe take a moment and see uh, if uh, you can tell me how many incidences are here. Anybody wants to share or is it too silly and you just want me to say? Six. Six, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I'm just happy that someone is talking to me. <laughs> um, thank you. So, uh, um, Y6, this point is incident to two lines, this point is incident to two lines, and this point is incident to two lines. So it's six. All right. We usually don't care about such small configurations. We work asymptotically. So usually we're gonna say we have set P of M points and a set L of N lines. And then the set of incidences is in the Cartesian product of P and L. It's a set, it's a set of pairs from this Cartesian product points on lines. So here's another basic example. If you look at this drawing, uh, what do we have here? We have five points and seven lines. And if you believe me, when I wrote this slide, then 15 incidences. Why is that? There are three here, and three here, four here, three here, and two here. That's 15, okay? So is it okay? We understand the definition of incidences. Anybody wants to ask, comment, tell me that this doesn't make any sense, anything. All right, so Erdos, uh, try to see how many incidences we can have. Try to come up with a way of getting a lot of incidences. And he did what I think is a very intuitive thing to do. A lot of people probably tried it first. Uh, let's take a section of the integer lattice. So we want m points, we can take, a, for example, a square root of m by square root of m section of the integer lattice, like in the drawing here. It seems like there should be a lot of lines that contain a lot of points, right? It's easy to have a lot of lines that form a lot of incidences. So, sorry, maybe, maybe a stupid question, but I guess you're assuming that the lines and the points are distinct. Yes, okay, no stupid okay. questions, don't worry. Yes, the lines and points have to be distinct. Excellent point, because otherwise, I can just take all the points to be the same point and all the lines to be the same line and everything is incident to everything. Very good, yeah. yes. 
Uh, this is actually a, a becomes a much more serious issue when you go to higher dimensions, for example, three dimensions with planes. But okay, let's not get there just yet. Yes, yeah, so the points and the lines are distinct. Um, so I just said, okay, now let's try, if this is our point set, let's try uh, to see how we can take a lot of lines that form a lot of incidences. And it turned out there's a not too complicated way of doing it using Euler's Toshian function. If you take other Stoian function, you can do some calculations and you get to the number of incidences is this expression here. So what is this? Um, so C is some small constant. You can imagine it's one. It doesn't matter. It's actually pretty close to one. Uh, the important part is number of points to the two thirds, number of lines to the two thirds, plus M plus N. What are these two other terms? Why do we have them here? They don't matter too much. It's just that if the number of points is much larger than the number of lines, more than the square of the number of lines, then the M will dominate. If the number of lines is more than the square of the number of points, then N will dominate. These are really extreme cases that we don't usually see. The number of incidences is points to the two thirds, lines to the two thirds. And please uh, stop me if you want, be more like Patrick. If you're not sure about something, ask uh, or comment. All right. So, uh, okay, and then I just said, good. So we have this number of incidences. Can we, can we do better? Maybe we can be more clever and somehow get more in point line incidences than this. It took a few decades, but it turned out that the answer is no. So Samaradi and Trotter showed that the number of incidences between M points and N lines is just most the same expression. The constant is different, still a small constant doesn't matter much. Any M points and any N lines that you take, the number of distance, the number of incidences is gonna be at most number of points to the two thirds, number of lines to the two thirds. I think that's already pretty strange. Um, this is a very basic question, right? We just have points and lines in the plane, uh, lines on points, that's very elementary thing. Somehow the correct answer turned out to be uh, did you want to say something? Sorry. Yeah, I'm just, how about other geometries? Ah, very good. Yes. I, uh, we can talk about other geometries. I agree. Let's just start with, let's just finish the case, the easiest okay. case. And, and just a comment that they did it independently, not together. Two papers. Somebody in Trotter? Yeah. Really? So the, I, I did not know that. Uh, I... The paper is joint, but uh, you're saying that what? They, they each had a separate proof and then they uh, merged? Uh, well, maybe I'm wrong. Uh, okay. Oh, it's an interesting. I'm happy to check it out. Um, so the, the paper is definitely joint. Um, it's one paper. It's, uh, if I remember correctly, it was in the first volume of Combinatorica. Um, anyway, uh, so such an Elementary question. We'll get to the different geometries in a second. Thanks for the question. Um, so, so such an elementary question is for some reason the correct bound has two thirds, two thirds in the exponent. It's pretty weird, I think. Uh, this is something that happens a lot in this type of questions, type of combinatorial questions with some geometry. I wish I had a good answer why, uh, but I don't. If anyone has any anything clever to say about it, I'll be happy to hear. Um, and okay, so this is known for almost 40 years now. And the question is, uh, so, so why are we talking about this? And this is just one incidence problem out of many, many incidence problems. And almost all of them are open, wide open. For example, what happens if we take point circle incidences? Now we have points and circles. We don't know what's the maximum number of incidences or points and parabolas, we don't know. Or even points with unit circles. Circles will all have the same radius. We don't know, it's a major open problem. Or you can talk, think about points with uh, arbitrary curves of degree D. Or you can go to higher dimensions. What happens if we're in higher dimension? We can have hyperplanes, hypersphere, even just curves. What happens then? And people study incidence problems in complex spaces, in spaces over finite fields, and it gets a lot weirder. Uh, there's so many incidence problems. So are these point hyperplane incidences or yes. hyperplane? Okay. 
point hyperplanes. Yes, yes. So you can you can talk about what happens when you have I don't know in, uh, instances between lines and planes, for example. You can usually reduce it just to a different incidence problem between points and something. Okay. Um, so yeah, in all of these cases, it's points and something, right? Um, so so Hagai, I'm not sure what you meant by other geometries. Did you mean like going over other fields or something else? Just out of curiosity. hyperbolic, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. So right, so you can come up with a lot of incidence problems. It's a good point. And uh, for example, uh, logician, mo logicians, model theorists, they study this in much more abstract situation. There's all sorts of like. Uh, all minimal frameworks and this style and all sorts of these more abstract models that cover a lot of things. So there are a lot of incidence problems. Almost all of them are wide open. We know these uh, points and lines in the plane. We know a couple of other cases, but really that's it. We're far from saying we, we handle incidence as well. Um, and now you might ask, great, Adam. Uh, so you have a lot of incidence problems and uh, I'm sure you can publish a lot of papers this way, uh, but why do we need a million incidence problem? What is this good for? So there are all sorts of reasons why we care about these problems. I just wanted to mention one now. And- uh, Can I ask a question? Sorry. Yes, yes. I'm talking M, M, M to the two third, M to the two third is sharp, right? Uh, yes. For point line. Yes. Uh, this... to, to show that it is sharp, is there a point line configuration uh, that shows that it is exactly this number? Oh, so uh, yes, yeah, so the constant is open, uh, but the, mm -hmm. the, the m to the two thirds, m to the two thirds, right. So like, as I mentioned, for example, uh, there was the Erdős's construction that was actually a few decades before Samuel oh. and Schroeder, and that showed that it's tight. But there are other constructions. Mm -hmm. That's a great question because I'm, talk about, I'm going to talk about this soon. Mm, uh, okay. Great, thank you for asking. Yeah, I'm talking fast, so stop me just, <laughs> I know I'm not letting you barge in and up, but please, when you want, just stop me. Uh, yeah, I love those questions, keep asking. Um, so, so what I was starting to say is that I think that, so for some reason, incidence bounds are very useful. You, a lot of proofs, reduce a problem to an incidence problem or use incidence problem as part of a proof. And, and this might not be very surprising when you think about problems in combinatorial geometry, but it goes far beyond that. It's incidence bounds appear in places that are really surprising that seem not even related to geometry at first look. So let's do some name dropping. Um, for example, in the uh, if you know there was the huge good cuts breakthrough about the Erdős distinct distances problem. That was solved by reducing the problems to an incidence problem. Uh, Burgen and Demeter used to study restriction problems, problems in harmonic analysis using incidences. Uh, another Burgen paper with Bombieri, they had a, a number theory paper about sums of squares that reduce the problem to incidences. There are many problems, uh, Sorry, if you know the Kakeya conjecture, there are many Kakeya papers that use incidences. One example is Katz and Sal. Uh, people study expanding polynomials using um, incidences. And, and I'm sorry, but I had uh, the urge to have a second slide. There's just so many applications of this. So in additive combinatorics, so many problems, you rely on incidences. For example, if you know the sum product problem, that's heavily relies on incidences, at least some of the proofs. Um, in, th in theoretical computer science, uh, so there's this uh, big open problem, the Logren conjecture. And recently, uh, about a year ago, uh, there was a connection between that and an incidence problem. Uh, there are other computer scientists who use it in coding theory in all sorts of ways. And the list just goes on and on and on. And for some reason, we, people keep finding more and more uses of incidence bounds. Um, so I hope that this is one good reason why we should study a lot of incidence bounds. There are others. And I wanted to show one example, one example of how a problem that might not seem related to incidences turns into an incidence problem. So now I have a question for you. So my classic example, which I think is a very nice, elegant example to show, is the sum product problem. I can show Elakesh's, how Elakesh used incidences to get a sum product bound. But 
uh, when I made this talk, I was wondering, do any, if everyone here already know this proof very well, and I'm just going to bore you, I have a less well-known example here that I can do instead. Any thoughts? Do everyone here know well the sum product proof? Do you want to do a different proof? So I think I've only seen this proof maybe once, and I definitely couldn't reconstruct it on the top oh, of my excellent. head. So I wouldn't then say I know it. it well. But... Then let's do it. <laughs> let's do it. <laughs> OK. Um, thank you, Patrick. Good. Uh, I think it's a good example because it's an it's, it's a important problem that at first seems completely unrelated to geometry. And you can quickly get new results by just by looking at incidences. So let's do it first. Um, let's say we have a finite set uh, of integers or reals or whatever you like, doesn't matter. And then the sum set, A plus A here, is just the sum of all pairs of elements from A. You take every pair of elements, you look at their sum, and that's the sum set. For most sets, the sum set is going to be a quadratic in the size of the original set. Some about a squared times some constant. Why is that? Imagine that you take randomly, you randomly pick natural numbers or reals or whatever you like. The chance that a sum is gonna repeat several times is tiny. You don't expect the sum to repeat too many times. So you expect to have about a squared different sum up to a constant. But there are sets that that uh, have a very small sum set, only linear in a instead of quadratic. How can we get that? Um, so I don't know if everyone knows this, then I shouldn't ask you, but uh, anyone can guess what set might have a small sum set? Arithmetic progressions, right? Right. So an easy example, let's take maybe the simplest arithmetic progression, take the integers one, two, three, up to n. What's the sum set? So one plus one is two, one plus two is three, one plus three is four, et cetera, up to two n. Those are the sums we get. So the size of the sum set in this case is about two a, just linear in a. And uh, like you said, this is the case for every arithmetic progression, but also for other sets. There are other sets with a linear sum set, not just arithmetic progressions. Um, okay, and I, what I, what, the reason I mentioned this slide is the moral here is that most sets will have a quadratic sum set. But for some reason, there are sets that have something, maybe you can say they have some additive structure uh, that gives them a very small sum set. It's kind of a vague idea that we don't, this is an open problem, in fact, what exactly has a small, a small sum set. And we can say the same thing for product set. It's exactly the same. Product set is the set of all products of pairs of elements. Um, most of the sets uh, so that they have a quadratic product set, about a squared, but there are sets that have only a linear product set. What set might have a very small product set? So if before it was an, it was an arithmetic progression, what sets behave nicely under multiplication? Geometric progression. Right, geometric progression, very good. Mm -hmm. So for example, you can imagine powers of two. I kind of took the previous set and put it in the exponent of two, two to the one, two to the two, to the three. And the product set is also, it's just like before, but as the exponents. Before it was two to two n, now it's in the exponents are two to the two n. You can do even smaller in products, but that doesn't matter. Uh, it's about two a again, and it will happen for any geometric progression. And again, I can say most sets behave, uh, yeah have a large product set, about a squared. But for some reason, there are sets that have some sort of multiplicative structure that gives them a very small product set. The sum product question problem just asks, is there a set where both a, the sum set and the product set are small? Is it possible that there's a set of numbers that behave nicely both under addition and under multiplication? Or if you want my vague language, can a set have both additive structure and multiplicative structure at the same time? Is that possible? It's a very natural question, right? It's, I think it's a number theory question about adding and multiplying um, integers, a uh, very elementary question in some sense. And the conjecture is a big no. The conjecture is absolutely not in this sense. Erdős and Sam already conjectured that 
for any sufficiently large set, one of them, either the sum set or the product set, must be arbitrary close to the maximum. So the maximum size is A squared. They say, take any, any number that you like, A to the 1.999999. For any large set, either the sum set or the product set is going to be at least as large. It's close to the maximum. But this is a conjecture. Uh, after, again, almost 40 years, we're still very far from knowing the, the answer. Uh, at first, so, so number theorists worked on it. Uh, the first bound were kind of small improvements. Uh, there was uh, a bound that was like uh, showing that the sum set or the product set is at least A to the, I think it was 33 over 32, and I think it was 17 over 16, something like that. And in some sense, the biggest leap, the, the biggest jump we had so far in the first main breakthrough in some sense was by Elakish. And he just said, by using incidences, you immediately get a lot better. Still very far from where we want to be, from A squared to A squared, but much better than before. And still the biggest jump we ever had in the bound. And maybe it's worth mentioning, there was another big breakthrough later by Shoimoshi. I'm lying here, I'm ignoring all sorts of logarithms, but it's about A to the four thirds. And that's where we are more or less. There were a lot of improvements after Shoimoshi, but they were all very small. After that, there was an improvement to four thirds plus one over 20,000. And then there was four thirds plus one over 10,000. And if I'm not mistaken, where we are now is Rudnev and Stevens had four thirds plus two over 1,100. Um, anyway, so was, uh, how do we solve this number theoretic problem with incidents? It's actually a very short proof. And I should say, all the proof, all the proofs, all the bounds after Elakesh also relied on points and, and lines in the plane. So we just define points and lines in the plane. We don't have them. Let's, let's define. So the point set is going to be the sum set times the product set, the Cartesian product. Okay, just the Cartesian product of the sum set and the product set. The set of lines is will define a line with a linear equation. It's just all lines that are defined like this. Y equals C times X minus D. And we'll see in the air from A. So how many lines do we have? We can A choices for C, A choices for D. So we have A square lines. How many points do we have? The size of this Cartesian product, sum set times product set. I'm almost done with this. Um, okay, so we have points and lines. All we want to do is count the incidences. How can we count the incidences? We have the summary Trotter bound. Summary Trotter bound says the number of incidences, this is the standard notation for number of incidences between points of P and lines of L. Number of incidences is at most points to the two thirds, lines to the two thirds. I just plugged in the correct sizes here and I get some expression. It really doesn't matter. Um, and I can do the same thing in the other direction. Uh, sorry, I can also do an easy argument in the other direction, sorry. It's very easy to show that every line contains at least n point, a points. Sorry if I'm going too fast. If this is one of my lines, right? Every line is y equals something from a, x minus something from a. Take any element from a, lowercase a from a. This point is going to be on our line. You can plug in this point, d, d plus a instead of x, c, c times a instead of y. And you can see that it fits. The equation is satisfied. And this point is in this Cartesian product. The x coordinate is from the sum set. The y coordinate is from the product set. So every line contains at least a points. So the number of incidences is at least the number of lines times the number times a, which is a cubed. I'm going very fast. Let me know if you want me to slow down and repeat something. I, I don't care too much about the details. I just wanted to do it to give you a vague idea if you didn't know this proof before. And that's the end of the proof. We, what did we do? We defined the number of, we defined points and lines in the plane. Cartesian product of some certain product set and some lines. We had an upper bound of the number of incidences using Semerady and Troder. And we had a lower bound using this naive counting. Plug in both bounds together. A cube is at most the upper bound from Samaritan and Trotter. And you immediately get this. You tidy this up a bit and you get that the sum set times the product set is A to the five halves. You can just believe me, it doesn't matter. It's just some calculations. 
And that means that at least one of them has to be at least a to the five quarters. Otherwise, their product is not going to be at least a to the five halves. Good. So the problem that looked completely unrelated to incidences had a huge breakthrough by looking at incidences. Let's start going slowly again. <laughs> um, so uh, this happens a lot for some reason. For some reason, a lot of problems that seem completely unrelated to incidences, you can make progress on them by looking at incidences. Uh, I wish I had a good explanation for that I also. I don't know. I want to say that maybe incidence is some sort of kind of elementary natural object that that's why a lot of things lead to it somehow, but it's not a very satisfying argument. Um, okay, I didn't even get to the structural problem yet, but I just wanted to mention one more quick thing. Oh, that's my other less known application that we're gonna skip, something about minors of matrices, not today. Uh, here, I just thought I'll mention some ancient history. Before Eridosh, Sylvester wrote a few things about incidences. And before Sylvester, there was a paper, a, a book from 1821, Rational Amusement for Winter Evenings or a collection of above 200 curious and interesting puzzles, paradox, uh, paradoxes, this is a long name, it keeps going for a while. This book has a whole chapter with questions about incidences. Let me give you one example. Fain would I plant a grove in rows, but how must I its form compose? With three trees in each row, to have as many rows as trees. Now tell me, artists, if you please, is all I want to know. Is this an incidence problem? What did I just say? Something about trees? Uh, so let's translate it into current English. Uh, so in present day English, this would say something like place X points in the plane such that more than X lines contain three points. So here's a bad example. That's a failed attempt. Here we place seven points in the plane, but we only get six lines that contain three points. So we need at least eight. We want to place X points in the plane such that more than X lines contain three points. Uh, now I'm going to do something horrible to do in a talk. And I'm going to tell you that I'll tell you the answer at the end. So uh, now half of you are very, uh, um, pro probably the half of those who are still listening to me are probably going to start thinking about this and not listening to anything else I say. If you want, you can, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but I, uh, I'm going to tell you the answer at the end. All right, so this, uh, this talk is supposed to be about the structural Sam Rady Trotter theorem. What is that? So again, Sam Rady Trotter theorem tells us that M points and N lines is this number of incidences, M to the two thirds, N to the two thirds, at most. This is solved for almost 40 years, but the structural problem would be characterize the sets of M points and N lines that, are, that get approximately this number of incidences, asymptotically this number of incidences. What? sets, what configurations are going to achieve this? And even though this is such a central problem and is important for so many other things, and solved for about 40 years, we hardly know anything, really. It's, it's barely anything is known about what sets of points actually achieve this number. Um, OK, so the first thing I want to do is simplify it a bit. It's so hard, we don't care about the small details. Let's just say M and N are the same, okay? We have N points and N lines, and the number of incidences is N to the four thirds. So that's the only thing I changed in the slide. It doesn't matter much. So we're looking for points, for configurations of N points and N lines with N to the four thirds incidences. How should that look like? What do we know? So as I, as I write here, hardly anything is known. You can ask now, okay, if hardly any, what, what is known? Why do I say hardly anything? So there are a few basic things you can say. There's few observations that are not too hard to prove. And I am only aware of one previous result that was not an easy observation. Shoimoshi again, uh, said the, proved the following result. It holds for every K. So you take a fixed K and it holds for any sufficiently large N. It says the following, 
if you have n points and n lines and about n to the four thirds incidences, then there are k points, no three on a line, such that there's a line passing through every pair. Again, so you can think of it, if you think of the configuration as a graph where the vertices are the points, then it's kind of like saying there's a, there must be a complete graph of k vertices, of k points. There must be somewhere k points with lines passing through every pair. So that's something, right? That's a definitely a non-trivial uh, thing to say, but it's very far from telling us how, how the optimal configurations should look like, right? It's, we still don't really know what to, ex to even expect. How, what, sort, what should we conjecture would be how uh, the optimal configuration, the endpoints and end lines with n to the four first incidences. Okay, so let's see what else we know. What configurations do we have to, to use for conjectures? So when we started this work, we only had two examples. There was Erdos configuration that we already mentioned before, square root of n by square root of n section of the integer lattice. And in 2001, Elakesh again, found another construction. And the nice thing about this construction is that it's much easier to show that it works. You can explain it to a high school student. It doesn't require anything. In Erdős's case, you need the Euler-Torsian function and some not so not completely trivial configuration. This is completely trivial count. Very nice example. And in this case, it's also a section of the integer lattice, but not an even one. It's n to the one third by n to the two thirds. And I also wanted to mention they both had this interesting thing that in both constructions, there are about n to the one third line slopes. And each slope has about n to the two third lines with the slope. So there are a lot of families of a lot of parallel lines. Okay, so when we start, we, when we these are the only two examples when we had when we started this. So what can we conjecture? Um, so I don't know, we can conjecture many, many things. Here's an example. Um, is the point set always a lattice? Or maybe if not, maybe we can at least something say, some, say something weaker, but in that direction, like maybe there's always a line that contains square root of n points. Are these the only two configurations? Are there other sporadic configurations, an infinite family of configurations? Um, are there always about n to the one third slopes with each with about n to the two third lines? Is there a structure to the set of slopes of these slopes? Is there a structure to the sets of y-intercept of the same slope, lines with the same slope? And I'm sure you can come up with many other questions, right? It's really not clear what we should expect from these two configurations. So the first thing we did is we managed to find an infinite family of constructions. Uh, so instead of two configurations, we now have infinitely many. And it goes like this. For every alpha between one third and one half, there exists a lattice, a section of the integer lattice, of size n to the alpha times n to the one minus alpha with n to the four thirds incidences. And the nice thing is that when alpha is one half, you get Erdős's construction. When alpha is one third, you get Elekesh's construction. So it's kind of, in some sense, you can think of it as interpolating the two, although it's not exactly that. Um, and in all of this construction, we have n to the one third line slopes and each with n to the two third lines with each slope. Okay, so that's a start. We have something. Uh, there are not just two sporadic configuration. There are infinitely many configurations, but maybe there are more. Are there constructions not in this family? There are different looking constructions. Okay, um, so let's ask some more questions here. We can ask, is the point set always a lattice? Okay, right, that looks like a strong property. If we can say the point set is always a lattice, that, that's a nice characterization of where we are. But that's a very tricky thing to say. Why is it tricky? For a lot of reasons, let's start with one. First, do a projective transformation. If you do a projective transformation on, the, on a configuration with, with a lattice, it preserves lines, it preserves incidences and it's not exactly a lattice anymore in the standard sense. Okay, so that's one issue. So maybe we can say, maybe the point set should always be projectively equivalent to a lattice. It's not such a big deal, right? Similar. Another problem. 
you can add noise. Throw away half of the points, which removes about half of the incidences. Add instead random points that maybe these points have zero incidences. It doesn't matter. And now it's not a lattice, right? It's, it's something else. It's half of it is a lattice and half of it is just completely random. So, okay, so maybe we should say large intersection between the point set and a set that is projectively equivalent to a lattice. Is that what we should say? It's more, it keeps getting weirder. Um, you know, point line duality, uh, in case someone here is not familiar with this, point line duality turns all the points into lines and all the lines into points. A po there are several ways of doing this. Here's one. A point AB um, goes to this line, y equals ax minus b. A line y equals cx minus d goes to this point CD. Why do we do this? Why do we, what, what's the point of turning lines into points and points into lines? It preserves incidences. The green AB is incident to the red line, this one, if and only if the, red, the dual point CD is incident to the dual line, the green one. Both of them are equivalent to this equation, so it's the same. So I guess now we have to ask, is there a large intersection between the point set and a set that is a lot is up to a projective transformation and point line duality and maybe some other things? Maybe it's a tricky question, right? It's not something we can easily answer. It's starting to get complicated. Okay. Um, after we finished our work, remember I did this with the undergraduate Olivine Silier. She worked with Larry Guth later and they found another configuration or family of configurations that are not lattices. Uh, or at least I don't see an easy way of getting to a lattice. Maybe I'm missing. So it's basically, it's still a Cartesian product, A by A, this point set is A by A, but not of lattice, but it's not of a arithmetic progression like in a lattice, but if you know what the general arithmetic progression is, it's a general arithmetic progression of dimension two. And it still works. You still get into the four third incidences. So it seems like it doesn't even have to be a lattice. Sorry. Um, okay. So what do we have? If, if it is so complicated, what can we see? So here's what we can see. Uh, so we study specifically. Ed, yeah. Ed, Mia, uh, in the previous page, in the previous slide, mm -hmm. uh, what is the line set? Yeah, okay, so uh, you need to think how you can choose lines that contain a lot of points. Um, I'll be honest, I don't remember by heart how they look like, but uh, we, we didn't actually even say how the lines look like in the original construction. Uh, mm -hmm. If you want, we can look at it later. Okay, okay. Uh, okay. Um, mm -hmm. I, I forgot by now. It's okay. Um, okay. So, Sorry, any more questions, comments? If you remind me to, am I going too fast? Should I repeat something? All right. So uh, we only, so we have ways, new ways of finding structure, but it's specifically for Cartesian products. We consider uh, points that it's a Cartesian product. Now, it's possible that this is the only way to get a lot of incidences to begin with. All of our constructions have, are Cartesian products. And in most of the applications, for example, in the sum product proof that we saw, you also get a Cartesian product. So in some sense, this is the most interesting case, but it's still not the general case. Um, okay, so let me tell you what structure we can have. Uh, so this is the beginning of our structural result, just the beginning. So imagine that we have a Cartesian product of size n to the alpha by n to the r one minus alpha, just like before, okay? And, and alpha is again between third and half. We have a set of n lines and we have n to the four thirds incidences. Then one of the following must happen. Either 
there are many families of many parallel lines. There exists some beta such that there are about n to the one or n to the one minus beta families of about n to the beta parallel lines. So this is, there are many families of parallel lines or the other option, there are many families of concurrent lines. There are n to the one minus gamma families of n to the gamma concurrent lines. Uh, or intuitively it just says to have n to the four for its incidences, either you have many families of parallel lines or you have many families of concurrent lines. And you might ask, how does this fit the configurations that we know? So there's Erzurch construction and Elikesh's construction, and then our new infinite family that, that con contains those, and then the new family of uh, Olivine, Silier, and Larry Guth. All of those have many uh, families of parallel lines. We don't have any configuration that has many families of concurrent lines. So it's tempting to conjecture that this case cannot happen, but who knows, this is such a confusing situation here. Each time something new happens that I'm afraid of saying any conjecture. Uh, in another follow-up work that's not published yet, uh, we show that in a lattice, the concurrent case cannot happen. And also in some more general scenarios, the concurrent case cannot happen. But we still don't, cannot say that the concurrent case can never happen. It seems that, so we're in one of two cases, either the concurrent case cannot happen or there are constructions that are very different than the ones we have. They look completely differently, behave completely differently and we just didn't find them yet, hard to say. Okay, so I said that this was the first part of our structural theorem. Uh, second part it says, okay, let's say we're in the parallel case, possibly the only case. There are many families of many parallel lines. Then one of the following two cases holds. Either the set of slopes has, um, it's very vague for now, either the set of line slopes has nice multiplicative properties or the set of y-intercepts in each family has nice additive properties. So one of these two cases might happen. So either this multiplicative structure for the slopes or there's additive structure for uh, each family that you take, you take the y-intercept, you have nice additive structure. Okay, um, what do I mean? This is very vague, right? So let me make it a bit clearer. So uh, I have to introduce additive energy here. Again, uh, do anyone, every, do you, if you tell me that everyone here knows what additive energy is, I can skip it, but otherwise, okay, good. Thank you, Patrick, I appreciate the shaking of the head. Uh, so additive energy is a main object in additive combinatorics. It has a lot of uses. If you have a set of numbers, just like before, the additive energy is that very simple thing. It's this, how many quadruples you have from your set, how many quadruples A, B, C, D from your set satisfy this. Two numbers, sum up to two other numbers, two representations of the same sum, okay? That's all it is. How many solutions this has? I'm not gonna tell you a lot about additive energy. I still wanna spend one minute giving you some basic intuition about why this is, what it means and how it's helpful. Um, the additive energy goes between about A cubed and A squared. The minimum is about A squared, the maximum is about A cubed. Why? So how many solutions can we have for this equation? There are A choices for A, A choices for B, A choices for C, and then at most one choice for D. After we fix the first three parameters, there's at most one choice for D. So that's why you get at most A cubed. Why at least A squared? You can show that there are some kind of not so interesting quadruples that are always satisfied. For example, oh, I must have this issue with my slides, supposed to be A equals C. Consider the cases where A equals C and B equals D. There are a square of those. They're all clearly satisfy this. It's basically say a plus b equals a plus b. Not very interesting. There are more of those. Um, so, okay. So you're allowed to choose a number as many times as you want. Yes, a number can repeat twice. Okay. Yes, sorry. Yes, it's not gonna be a huge difference, but yes. Um, yes. Um, oh, I see, in as many quadruples as you want. Yes, a number is, was, can repeat in a lot of quadruples, yes. Um, it's, it's kind of just like, like you think of in, uh, I don't know, the Fontaine equations, uh, anything is allowed. There's no connection between the different solutions. You just want to know how many solutions there are. 
Um, okay, so some set goes between A and A squared approximately. Additive energy goes approximately between A squared and A cubed. And there's some sort, I don't wanna say correlation, but there's a strong connection between these two. A small sum set means additive structure, a high energy means additive structure. Okay, for example, a small sum set implies a high energy. This is very easy to prove. It's a one, it's a Cauchy-Schwarz argument. The energy is at least this expression. So think about it. When the sum set is close to minimal, when it's linear in A, the energy is close to maximal. It's cubic in A. So a small sum set implies a large energy. The opposite is not exactly true. It's the largest, uh, High energy doesn't necessarily imply a small sum set, but it's close to it. So this is what's called the, maybe you heard it before, the balog samaradi gowers theorem. And I'm not gonna phrase it, it accurately here, but basically it says a large energy implies a small sum set, possibly after removing some noise. What does that mean? Consider this set, take a set A that's half of it is an arithmetic progression, very good additive structure. And the other half is random, so no zero additive structure. Because of the structured half, the arithmetic progression, the energy is gonna be maximal, A cubed. Because of the random set, the sum set is gonna be maximal, A squared. But after you throw away the noise, you, stay, you get a set with a very small sum set. So, it can have a small sum set possibly after removing noise. That's the other direction. So additive energy, high additive energy in some sense means a lot of additive structure. Um, and you can, it's used in a lot of interesting ways. This is not the time to talk about it. Is that okay? Any questions, comments, anyone? Okay. okay. Multiplicative energy is exactly the same, but with product. How many quadruples we have A, B, C, D? A times B equals C times D. And again, it's, a, it's analog, it's, the, it's symmetric. The, it's a high multiplicative energy means high multiplicative structures. There's something similar to a correlation with a product set, etc. It's the same other multiplication. Okay, here's a result. Again, we're in the case of many families of many parallel lines. Then one of the following happens. Either the set of line slope has a large multiplicative energy, or for many of the families, the set of y-intercepts has a large additive energy. So one of the two must happen. That's what we can show. Uh, that's our result. Okay, now let me think, uh, how long should this talk be? You're not gonna give me an answer, huh? My answer is gonna be as long as you want. <laughs> yeah, but uh, what's standard? I don't want to get everyone to fall. Everyone are probably asleep, but still not. Uh... Um, I mean, so officially the, the seminar can go up to six. No, no. Okay. Um, the standard the... is, I don't know, anything between one and one and a half hours, I guess. So. Okay, so let's aim for about an hour. I don't like making things too long. So let's do 10 minutes, maybe a bit more than 10. Sure. That would be an hour. Sure. Um, all right, so so far I just told you results. Let's use this last 10 or maybe a bit more than 10 minutes to talk about how do we do it, a bit of technicalities. So, oh, sorry, I forgot something important. Where do we stand with respect to the configurations before I show you technicalities? Um, in all of our constructions, there are many families of parallel lines. We don't know of a single case where there are many families of concurrent lines. The set of slopes always have a very small multiplicative energy close to the minimum. And the y-intercepts in each family have very large additive energy close to the maximum. So it would be nice if this is correct, but we don't know. Uh, maybe these cases cannot happen, the other cases cannot happen, maybe they can. It would be nice if at least one thing behaves nicely here and it is the only case that's possible. Um, all right. So I wanna show you how very briefly in a few minutes, just a rough idea of how we prove those things. So the first thing we do is we think of a line, uh, we consider lines that are not axis parallel. Every such line, we can write it as y equals ax plus b. 
uh, and where a is not zero. It's not axis parallel, so the slope is not zero and it's not infinity. We can always write it nice in a nice way like this. And we're gonna associate with this line the linear function x plus b. Okay, so every line goes to a linear function x plus b. Why would we wanna associate the linear function with the line? Because now we can do all sorts of operations of lines. For example, we can compose lines. If we have two lines, ax plus b and a prime x plus b prime, we can just compose, we can say composing the lines is the same as composing their functions. And it's gonna look like that. That's the, that's the operation, it's another line, right? It's just another line. So composing two lines give the third line. And uh, I don't know, maybe someone wants to complain and say, okay, Adam, this is just uh, the, the affine group of R. This is true, it's just the affine group of R. But uh, we don't want to think of it like this. It's much easy, nicer for us to think of it as lines. So we have a group of lines. The non-parallel lines form a group. That's the important thing for us. The identity is y equals x. The inverse of the line looks like this. Doesn't matter. The lines are now a group. OK, why do we want the lines to be a group? We want to define a line energy. So just like we had additive energy, and multiplicative energy, you can define a line energy. Uh, so it's gonna be the number of quadruples of lines that we have that satisfy this equation. So it's almost like before, maybe I'll draw something quickly. So before we wanted the number of solution to a plus b equals c plus b. It's exactly the same as saying a minus c equals uh, d minus b. It doesn't matter. Saying uh, the addition and subtraction are the same here. And usually subtractions, it's nicer to work with. Uh, differences are nicer to work with, and it turns out here they're not the same, but it's still easier to work with the subtraction case, which is why we have the inverses here. But it's the same. It's just like uh, add additive energy, basically, but for lines. Amazingly, this also comes from Elikesh. Elikesh had a paper about something else. He didn't, the, the word energy was not coined by then. Uh, this was coined by uh, Tao and Vu when they wrote their additive combinatorics book. Uh, there is Tao and Van Vu. Um, and it wasn't even a central thing in his paper. It didn't define it as an object of interest. It just appeared in a proof. In the middle of some proof, this object is defined and used to do a few steps and that's it. And it seems that no one, as far as I can tell at least, no one paid it too much attention and it was forgotten. I don't see any reference to it until a few years ago, uh, Rudnev and Shkredov kind of revived it and they did all sorts of things with it. And one of the interesting things they noticed is a connection between incidences. Again, everything is somehow related to incidences, right? Um, so they showed, let's say you have a Cartesian product, A by B and a set of lines L, not axis parallel. Then the number of incidences is the most this weird expression. The important thing part is green, is in green. That's the line energy. There's an upper bound for the number of incidences with respect to the line energy. And that's exactly what we need. I mean, there are obviously a lot of technicalities. What about axis parallel lines, a lot of other things. But basically what he says is that if you have a lot of incidences, the line energy must be large. Right? It's kind of the opposite of the way they was intended to use it. Um, if there are a lot of incidences, there must be a, a high line energy. And that's exactly what we needed. It's structure. What happens when there are many incidences? Okay. Um, now, we, we also have another couple of bonds for the line energy. So here's an interesting one we, know, we observed. Uh, if the set of lines is, behaves like a Cartesian product, Imagine that all the slopes come from a set S and all the y-intercepts come from a set Ys and we just take all the, Cart the Cartesian product of those, all the lines coming from those. Then the line energy is at most the this product set of the slopes, sorry, the uh, multiplicative energy of the slopes times the additive energy of the y-intercepts. We don't have this. We don't have that our lines behave so nicely like a Cartesian product, but you can still make it work for any set of lines that something along these lines, something similar to this still holds. And there was another recent work after the Rudnev spread of work uh, by Petridis and Rush Newton and Rudnev and Warren. And it got another bound for the line energy in terms of parallel and concurrent lines. 
And these bounds are exactly the two things that we need up to many, many technicalities. They tell us if we have a lot of incidences, then the line energy is large. And these bounds help us understand what happens when the line energy is large. And, and this is very roughly, ignoring a million details, how the proof works. By the way, to prove this bound, they also used an incidence bound. So we're, you, you, they obtained a line energy bound by using an incidence problem. And then we're using the line energy bound to, to help with another incidence problem. Uh, they, they, but it was a more complicated incidence problems. It was with planes in a higher dimensional space, doesn't matter. Okay, um, so this was very roughly, right? I, I didn't tell you most of the details. I just wanted to give you a very rough impression of how, what we used to do it. It's kind of the, we think of the lines as a group and then we have a line energy. And then by studying this line energy, we get structure. Um, all right, so here's a quick conclusion. We obtained some structural results for incidences with Cartesian product, but there are still a lot more questions than problems. I mean, it's nice. I, I like a result because hardly anything was known. And now we can at least say that a bit is known, but it's still very little. Um, we don't know. Maybe there are undiscovered constructions that behave completely differently. We don't know if the point set must be a Cartesian product. Maybe not. Uh, we, our bonds are probably far from tight. I didn't really spend time talking about how good our bounds are, they're not tight, I, I'm guessing. Uh, you can probably get stronger bounds about how many families of how many parallel lines you have, how large the energy needs to be, etc. cetera. Um, we don't know about whether there is a case where the high multiplicative slope energy exists. In all of our cases, the slope energy is, is very low. And a lot of other questions. This is just the beginning, right? We, we still have so much to do. And it seems worth it because so many problems reduced to the summary order theorem that if we understand it structurally, it really likely to help with many other problems. Maybe I'm wrong, but that's what it seems to me. Uh, good. And now I owe you a question for a riddle. Unless people want to say more about this, anything anybody wants to say more about this before I, uh, the answer to the riddle. So here was the riddle. Can we place x points in the plane? such that more than X lines contain three points. So if we have seven points like here, we need eight lines and we only have six. Anyone happen to not listen to me at all and solve the problem? They're probably not listening to me now also if that's the case, right? Uh, all right. So, so I, didn't, I didn't see the more than X part. I think I found one with the same number. Oh, okay. What's the same number? I think I can do 10. 10 points and 10 lines? Yeah. Nice. Uh, do you want to draw it or? And I, I think from that, I could probably do 11 points and 11. Yeah, nice. uh, 12 okay. lines, but yeah. Oh, nice. Nice. OK, so so here's how you do. Do you want to show it or should I just show the answer I have here? Okay. No, you can give yours. You, if you want to show your solution, you're welcome to brag about <laughs> no, it. No, because I you haven't really it. thought it through all the way. So okay. it's going to be embarrassing if it's wrong. <laughs> no, it's not going to be embarrassing. Come on. It's math. Everyone is wrong all the time. That's what are you talking about? <laughs> um, so the easiest or smallest example is using Papus's hexagon theorem. If you don't remember, there's the theorem where you take two lines and you take three points on each and you draw, connect the pairs of points and you get that the points in the middle are also collinear. So the, this theorem will only give you nine lines in general, but if you align it properly, so it will give you, for example, here, everything except the vertical line. Here we align the points very carefully so that we get also this vertical 10th line. It's unrelated to Pappus's theorem. That theorem will tell you three points on this line and the two lines you start with, uh, three points on uh, six of the of these intersection points uh, on the new lines that you draw and one more in the middle. Wait, that is 10, that is 10? No, okay, so you have to align it to get 10. Um, but today, so I, I'm guessing that this was the answer in, uh, in the riddles book from 200 years ago. Uh, but today we can do a lot better. Today you can have not just one more, you can have you can have the number of lines be about the square of the number of points. How do we do that? So you can use a group of a cubic curve. A group of a cubic curve, um, if you don't remember, 
So the elements of the group are points on the curve. And what's the group operation? You get two points. You take the line through both of them. And the result is the third intersection point with the curve. The lines would intersect between three points. Uh, so. Etan, I have a question. Uh, in, the question is about uh, every point is incident to at least one line. Every, where, sorry. In this uh, configuration, hexagon theorem, for example, every point is incident to, I don't know, two, three, at least one line, is it the condition? No, no, but I, otherwise you can just throw it out. It's not going to help you in any way, right? I mean, if you have a point that's not incident to anything, then then it's not helping. You, you don't need... Yes. In this yes. specific configuration, every point is, uh, is on at least three lines, right? Uh, yeah, one thing that's easy to right. show, one thing right. that's easy to show is that uh, maybe I'll mention it also in what we've been talking about in the structural theorem. Uh, you can always remove points that are not incident to many lines uh, because mm. they're not, it's not going to affect the number of, they don't contribute to having a lot of incidences. Usually points that are incident to less than n to the one third lines, you can throw them mm -hmm. up. That's a lot of lines. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. okay. Uh, so here, uh, yeah, so you can just use uh, a group of a cubic curve to get, it's, it's not exactly, but the number of lines is going to be close to the square of the number of points, much better than the book intended, but using more modern tools. Uh, okay, okay. So that is the end. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, that's it. All right. Thank you very much, Adam, for the talk and for the fun riddle. Um, do we have any questions? I have a question. For the structural theorem for the average distance problem, so mm -hmm. if we have n points in the plane, there is at least an over square root log n distances. Yeah. And the conjecture, uh, the expectation was, is it uh, LLT's configuration only? Uh, so it seems that there might be some other configurations similar to this uh, that gives the minimum number of uh, distances, right? Okay, yeah, so, so, okay. so, so the question, okay. So the question is, what, is this related to the structural problem of Erdős distinct distances theorem? Exactly, so, yeah. Yeah, so I should first say to other people maybe who are listening, uh, in this field or subfield, or I don't know how to call it, where we deal with incidence problem and distinct distances problems and other related problems, we are horrible, horrible at structural problems. I mean, mm -hmm. most of extremal combinatorics, it's standard, you have a problem. First you find the extremal bound, then you find the structural problem, then you solve the structural problem. In this type of problems, we cannot do it. We find, we solve, people find the best extremal bound. It's extremely, extremely rare we can say something good about the structure of problem. So summary disorder is maybe the most elementary example of this, but it happens everywhere. So it, if you know the distinct distances problem, it also happens there. There we, you can say we know even less. Um, we really don't, there's so many conjectures about the structure of point sets with few distinct distances and we cannot prove even really, really basic conjectures there. Uh, so the question was about whether our constructions here lead to constructions there. And I don't think it's directly related. Uh, if you know the good and cuts proof for distinct distances, it's, it shows that the distinct distances problem goes to a incidence problem between points and lines in three dimensions. So getting a structure for points and lines in three dimensions should be equivalent to similar to structure for distinct distances. Yeah. Getting structure for points and lines in two dimensions is not the, uh, at least mm. I, don't, I don't see why it would be the same. I, can, I could be missing something, but it's not the same thing. Okay, I see, I see. Uh, yeah, yeah, it would be, uh, since we're failing saying too much about the plan, it seems hard to say more about three dimensions, but that would be very interesting, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, so if I can ask something? Sure. Of course. 
And so if you if so you get this uh, large energy bounds for for such thermal set. So if you apply Balog similarity gammas or anything and some Feynman or I don't know, then maybe you get some uh, some smaller uh, lattice part. Right. So that's a good question. So, so in, this is in in connection to this uh, to this uh, Sholimoshi uh, thing where you had the complete graph as a subgraph. Right. Uh, so so Sholimoshi his main tool was the the triangle removal lamp actually coming from this from a different direction in some sense. But yeah, uh, yeah. Um, so this is not. This is not additive energy, right? It's line energy. It's uh, so we don't have exactly. At least I don't. I don't think we have a Balog Samaradi Gauss for this type of energy. But yeah, this this, in some sense, this <laughs> this is what we're trying to do, right? We're trying to get structure from having a high energy. Yeah, yeah. So Elakesh, when he studied these objects at the beginning did something a bit similar but but as far as i can see it's not what we need uh but okay sorry my answer is yes i think this is an excellent comment it would be very interesting to do this i don't know how <laughs> uh, I, I, uh, I really like this that these incidence problems are related to basically groups and energy and you can study them with these tools but we're not we don't know enough yet it's, it's maybe yeah, maybe it should be my next research project at some point. And uh, maybe just another small question. If you get all these structural results and uh, maybe a week or I don't know, uh, you get some results, but uh, there are various proofs of Samaritan Trotter. Uh, for instance, using uh, right uh, um, uh, crossing bounds, right? Uh -huh. So yes. do you get any result in this way about crossing uh, classification or whatever? That's a good question. Uh, I didn't think of this specific direction. So, uh, so I know that people have tried to look at it, not using the crossing proof, but using the cutting proof. So when you partition the space into cells, uh, well, I say proof. too much because people were telling me this in person, but in private, but like I, I know of all sorts of people who try to approach it in this direction, uh, some fancy names, and uh, so far there's not much. Um, the crossing number that's interesting. So it's a non construct, it's a non constructive proof, right? It's probabilistic, it's probabilistic, and there's like three families of different constructions, so it's even harder, maybe. Yeah. Uh, so how would it be? So we would say something like, uh, let. Yeah, I need to think of. It's a nice. You have good ideas. <laughs> you have nice ideas here. I don't know. I I, I cannot say try that that approach. Okay. Thanks. Uh, thank you. It's, these are not questions. These are good suggestions. <laughs> um, yeah. All right. Are there any other? Suggestions or questions or inputs or comments or anything? Limericks. Limericks, yes. Riddles. That doesn't seem to be the case. So thank you again very much, Adam, for the answers. And I will stop the recording.